Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, a viewer suggested some time back if I could do a blog about designing a product from scratch, from start to finish. And well, it sounds like a good idea, but it's actually incredibly difficult because there's a lot of issues and concepts which go into a designing an entire product. But I'm willing to give it a go. So here we go. I'm going to show you how I designed a product from start from concept to finish. So the best example I could come up with for this, I think, is my microcurrent adapter. You've seen it before, and um, it was published in Silicon Chip Magazine, April 2009. And uh, I think this is a really good example of how to design a simple product from start to finish, because there's not much in the circuit. It's a very, very simplistic circuit. But as you'll see, there's a lot more to designing a nice little product than just the circuit. So, what's the first step? Well, the first step is to define the problem and define what product you're going to design to solve that problem. In this case, it's burden voltage uh, on multimeters. Now, I won't go into why burden voltage is a problem. You can see my previous, uh, one of my previous blogs for that. So I won't go into why I'm actually going to design this. But let's just say it's a problem and we're going to fix it. So, what do we have here? Let's take a look at the problem. The problem is you've got a power supply unit, you've got a multimeter which has a shunt resistor in there to measure the current when you're powering your particular circuit. Now the voltage across here, this shunt resistor, is too high in a lot of cases and that causes all sorts of problems. So we want to lower that value of shunt resistor and still use our multimeter. Okay, so what we want to do is design a little doodad box that uh, that works with our multimeter that plugs in in series with it and it lowers this value of shunt resistor here. It lowers the burden voltage. So here it is. We need a box. Let's put dash. We need uh, we still need a current shunt resistor because that's how you measure current. You have a shunt resistor and, and you measure the voltage drop. Nothing's going to change there. There's no secret to it. So it's very simple. But we just need to make it much lower than the one inside a typical multimeter. How much lower? Well, uh, as always in electronics, you talk, you know, an order of magnitude or 10 times uh, is always a good thing. So 10 times less in value, that's not bad, but we'll go into that later. Maybe 100 times. But um, so the value will be lower. And because the value is lower, there's a kookaburra. Tell we're in Australia. <laughs> now, um, because the value, the shunt resistor is lower, the multimeter is not going to be able to measure that value. So you need an amplifier of gain that we haven't determined yet. So that's it. That's all we're going to have in our box is a shunt resistor and an amplifier. Too simple. And there'll be a battery to power it as well. But that's our entire product. But let's look at the detail which goes into actually designing the final product. Next up, let's look at the basic specs we want to do. Now, the main problem I wanted to overcome is basically on the, typically on the microamps and the milliamp ranges. I didn't really care much about the amps range, so uh, what we want to do is have multiple ranges. Obviously, one range isn't going to do the whole thing. It's just not going to work, um, as we'll probably uh, deduce later. So we need something with different ranges. We basically need uh, three different value current shunt resistors. Now there's two basic ways to, uh, to do this. Either you have one set of input sockets like we do here, okay, and you switch in, you, you have a three-way, well let's say a three-way switch and you switch in different current shunt resistor values. Or you can have uh, one ground terminal and then a different, um, a different four millimeter banana terminal for each current range. But these banana terminals are quite expensive and it's just it's, it takes up front panel board space and I wanted to make this thing as small as possible. So really, I think I thought it was better just to um, do the range switching based on a switch. OK, so we've decided that we're actually going to switch the inputs for the different ranges. So we get rid of this idea down here and now we need to figure out what value these resistors need to be for our different ranges. Now, because what we're basically trying to do here is use a multimeter to measure current, uh, we can't use the existing current range on the multimeter because it has its own current shunt resistor. So what we do 
is we use the voltage range of the multimeter, which just so happens to be the most accurate range, as we'll come into. That's actually a, a, an, a, an important advantage. Now, as it turns out, usually the millivolt range on a digital multimeter is the most accurate and it's the easiest to use. So that makes sense to use the 200 millivolt range on a 2000 count multimeter. So what we want is um, different current ranges. We want, let's say, we want to directly convert um, uh, current into voltage. So we want one millivolt per milliamp for the milliamp range, one millivolt per microamp for the microamp range, and one millivolt per nanoamp, because I think it might be handy if we include some nanoamps as well. Now let's not limit our options here. We may actually want to measure amps as well, just for good measure, if it's easy to add to the design. Uh, but we'll find that out later. So you might have one millivolt per amp. Now let's look at what value current shunt resistors we need to do that directly. One millivolt per amp um, using Ohm's law is one milliohm. One millivolt per milliamp is one ohm. One millivolt per microamp is one k. One millivolt per nanoamp is one meg. They're what we need for the current shunt resistors, but Really, that's the same as what's in a regular multimeter. We don't want that. We want to decrease it at least an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude. So, um, you know, we have to sort of make a decision there. One order of magnitude 10 times is pretty good, but I'd prefer 100 times. So I'm just going to pick that as an arbitrary figure. I'd like my design to be 100 times lower. So in this case, um, 1 ohm equals 10 milliohms because we want it, uh, the value to be one one hundredth of that value. So it's 10 milliohms. Likewise, 1K is 10 ohms and 1 meg is actually 10 K ohms. So they're the values for our three current shunt resistors if we use a times 100 amplifier. Now we have to take a cursory look at the amps range to see if it's easy to add to our design. Now, um, a standard um, uh, for one millivolt per amp on a standard multimeter, it's a one milliohm shunt resistor. That's already very low. One millivolt per amp, and all typical multimeter has a 10 amp uh, current range, so it's going to be only a 10 millivolt drop. So it's not really a big deal. So I don't really think that there's a problem to be solved there by having amps. And when you go up um, in very high currents, like this, you have real problems with your connection resistances, um, as we'll actually see later, even on the milliamp range. So uh, really, we, you know, amps is, is quite hard to add. I mean, we could change that instead of one millivolt per amp, we could change it to 100 millivolts per amp and gain a, um, a you know, a 10 times um, advantage or something like that. But, you know, I, I don't think there's a problem to be solved there. So let's not bother. I think we'll scrap that amps range because we don't want to use a 10 micro ohm resistor to get the same uh, to get the same ratio ranges as our other ones. So it's a it's a bad idea. No amps. It's gone. All right. So our basic design is taking shape. We have three different current ranges: milliamps, microamps, nanoamps. We have uh, three different current shunt resistors, which are a hundred times lower than a standard uh, multimeter, basically. And to compensate for that, we've got a times 100 amplifier in there as well. And the good thing is, is that uh, there's a direct relationship between one millivolt and one milliamp, one millivolt, one microamp, and so on, so that our multimeter um, is going to read directly in amps per millivolt. So if you're on the 200 millivolt range and it's reading 200, you're actually reading 200 milliamps. That's really nice. You don't need any, the user doesn't have to do any conversions or anything like that. So that's a really nice design criteria, which we meet easily by having, um, by not having oddball value resistors. We're going to choose them to give us a matching relationship between millivolts and milliamps. So the design's pretty simple. We've got three current shunt resistors and a times 100 amplifier. It sounds pretty simple. But now, here's where the practical considerations come in. Now, if you know your basic um, op-amp theory, no op-amp is perfect, okay? That's going to have an input offset voltage, which is called VOS, okay? The input offset voltage can be, you know, in a typical general purpose op-amp, it might be millivolts, okay? But 
that value is going to be, because we've got a times 100 gain, if we've got a 1 millivolt offset on our op amp, we're going to get 100 millivolts offset. We're going to get 100 millivolts offset. So even when we're not feeding in any current at all, our output could read up to 100 millivolts. Now, if we're using the millivolt range, we're all, you know, if um, it's going to read, if we're on one millivolt per milliamp, that means our output's going to read 100 millivolts. The user will think, oh, we're feeding in 100 milliamps. We're feeding in nothing like it. So, with the times 100 gain, we also need a, basically a 100 fold uh, reduction or so in that um, V, in that input offset voltage. So, we need to find a very schmick op amp that can actually do that. Now we should look at how we're actually going to use this doodad with the multimeter. Let's take a bottom of the range three and a half digit 2000 count multimeter, okay? We know we're using it on the millivolt range, okay? So that's going to have a value of 200.0 millivolts, okay? So its resolution is 0.1 millivolts. Now, when we feed in no current into here, we want it to measure nothing on the output. So we need the offset voltage, because we have a gain of 100, we need the offset voltage to be 100 times lower than this resolution, the least significant digit. So 0.1 millivolts divided by 100 is 1 microvolt. And that's what we need for our, v, for our um, input offset voltage of this op amp. So we need to look, search for an op amp that can do um, typically 1 microvolt offset. So when we feed in no current into here, we basically read zero on our multimeter. Now, from my industry knowledge, I know one microvolt input offset voltage is incredibly low, and you're going to need a very, very schmick op amp to do it, and there's not many on the market that are actually going to meet that spec that we have here. So, but um, I've done a blog on this before, as it so happens, and if you do your basic uh, electronics theory, you'll do different types of um, uh, op amps, and one of them is called a chopper or an auto zero uh, op amp. And these have the characteristic of having incredibly low input offset voltages. It's almost zero because they automatically, there's an automatic process inside the amplifier that, um, that nulls out the input offset voltage. Now, even if you didn't know about chopper amplifiers or auto zero amplifiers, what you would do in this case, if you wanted one microvolt offset voltage, you would go on the web and you would search either DigiKey or Mouser or one of the other component suppliers that gives you a parametric search for, for a particular op amp. So you might type in op amp and then you go into the op amp categories, you go into precision op amps or whatever, and then it's, it'll have a whole list of tables of all the parameters and one of them will be the offset voltage and they'll be listed from 0.1 microvolts down all the way to you know a horrible one at you know 10 20 millivolts or something like that so what you want to do is you want to select the ones that are in the range you know 0.1 microvolts to to 1 microvolt or something like that and then you want to narrow your search down to that now you can also do the same thing on the individual manufacturer's website. So you might know, if you're experienced in the industry, you might know that Maxim do op amps, National Semiconductor, Linear Technology, companies like that. So you'll go to their individual websites, but that can typically and do the same parametric search, but that can take longer. So I often use DigiKey or Mouser or uh, you know Newark or one of the other component suppliers and search all the different brands parametrically. So your parametric search spits out numbers like LMP2015 or LMV2011 or, or the MAX4238, uh, 4239. So what you do is you open up the data sheets for all these different chips and you start comparing them. In this case, our main requirement really is that input offset voltage. Now, one of the things you've got to um, uh, take into account with practical designs is a temperature range. Things like input offset voltage and all sorts of other parameters vary over temperature. So we don't want our product just working at room temperature, we want it to work over a decent, um, you know, industrial temperature range, because that's good design practice. So you will search the data sheets and you will look for the um, typical input offset voltage over the entire temperature range, not just at 
not just at 20 degrees Celsius at room temperature, no. You want it over the whole range. And, and you compare these different chips, and I compared them, and it turned out that the Maxim 4238 slash 4239 was, was pretty much the best with um, a typical offset voltage of 2.5 microvolts over the entire temperature range. And it was a reasonable price. It's only a couple of dollars. So I decided to base my design around that. And there are other things to look for as well, like overload recovery with chopper amps and and uh, and gain bandwidth product and stuff like that. Because but because this is a little current adapter and your average multimeter only has a couple of kilohertz bandwidth anyway, then pretty much any of these um, chopper amps is going to meet the bandwidth requirement. So the Max 4239 looked um, looked you know fairly ideal. And because Maxim have a nice free chip sample service that's that's an extra sweetener even though i have issues with maxim chips um i put that aside and i decided to go with the maxim device this time so i've chosen our max 4239 chip now if you look at the data sheet it has a, um, a vos a typical vos of 0.1 microvolts beauty at all, but the main thing is is that its um offset voltage is still only 2.5 microvolts over the entire temperature range so even absolute worst case if we feed no current into here um, uh, times 100 we're only going to get um, 2.5 it's only going to read plus minus 2.5 on the meter and well it's you know in practice it's going to be better than that it's going to be you know 0.1 or something like that so I can live with that that's fine so let's give it a go okay so we now have our basic circuit we've got three different current range resistors 10k 10 ohms and 10 milli ohms via an input switch which switches the range and we're also going to need a switch as well which is a dual ganged switch to actually um, tap off the uh, voltage from one of the resistors into the amplifier so we need a three we need a double pole uh, three-way uh, gang switch there now we've got our max 4239 as configured as a times 100 amplifier here and that's it that should give us our basic functionality that we're after but there's one other thing to consider as well now um do we use a standard single-ended amplifier or do we implement a differential amplifier well because we're not um dealing with long lines or anything like that our current shunt resistor is going to be on the same board right next to the chip we don't really need a uh, differential Amplifier and because the whole thing is going to be battery powered in a box. There's no problems with uh, you know mains reference or any other system reference like that So really we can get away with just a um, single ended Amplifier so all we need is a positive times 100 gain so that we uh, configure the op amp in a standard non-inverting configuration of times 100 so what values do we choose for the non-inverting values? Well, because we don't want to use um, too much current, it's going to be battery powered. We'll make that one say 1K and this one has to be, it has to have a gain of times 100. So your basic formula for your non-inverting op amp is um, R1 on R2 plus one. So if this is 1K to give you a gain of 100, this needs to be 99. K. So 99K divided by 1K is a gain of 99 plus one gives you a gain of 100 easy and because we're only dealing with you know a bandwidth of only several kilohertz um, these values can be reasonably high and you don't have to worry about stray capacitances and all that sort of stuff now there's one other thing I mentioned before about the large current range is the amps range um, the contact resistances on the components and the connectors and things like that can make it can swamp the value of your low value shunt resistor well even on our milliamp range here this is our milliamp range we've got a value of 10 milliohms now that's very that's that's actually very low um and uh, your contact resistance of a typical switch might be in the order of milliohms so it's going to be it's you know it's going to swap that it's, it's going to swap that in terms of accuracy so when you're measuring something you don't want to measure between ground here and this and the input connector because then you're actually measuring effectively a resistor in series with that that might be say you know or it might be one milliohm so what well, one milliohm so you're one milliohm in series with 10 milliohms you've got 11 milliohms your accuracy has just gone out the window so you don't want that so what you need is to tap it straight off the actual resistor like that so 
you want to actually connect it right on to the junction. I'll show it like this, but it's actually the junction right on the actual resistor. Now you can actually get special current shunt resistors that do exactly this. They're actually got four terminals on them. Um, your regular resistor and then two sense terminals like that. So that's what you actually want to tap off into the amplifier so it doesn't matter what the switch um, the value of the the resistance of your switch is now your switch is going to affect your bird the um, total burden voltage on the milliamp range but that's not a big deal because we're still an order more than order of magnitude lower than a regular multimeter so it's just fine and of course when we're talking 10 ohms and 10k on the other range as well you know the contact resistance of the switch doesn't matter there's yet another thing you have to think about. There's always something to think about in even basic designs like this. In this case, it's the operation of it. We want to measure current um, positive and negative. So if the current actually is flowing in like that, it's going to generate a positive voltage across there and it's going to generate a positive um, output there. But what if we've accidentally users hooked it up backwards or the current is um, AC then it's going to be flowing in that direction in this case we're going to get out a negative voltage with respect to our output ground terminal so what we need we can't power this off amp from a single supply we're going to need a dual supply so we're going to need a positive supply and a negative supply so that um, if this is your input ground here Okay, this input terminal is effectively ground because it's battery, it's just an internal ground, it's not mains earth referenced or anything like that. Um, if we power this from positive and negative supplies, then our op amp can actually get out, um, can uh, generate positive and negative output voltages, and that's what we want. Okay, so that's no big deal. You need a positive and negative supply. What's so hard about that? Well, there's actually a bit of thought which needs to go into this as well. And it's about the practicality of your whole design and things like that. There's three different methods you can use to get a positive and negative supply from, some, uh, from batteries from a little device. The first one is to put two batteries in series like that. In this case, uh, two double A's or triple A's, 1.5 volts each, and the center tap becomes the ground and then the either side becomes the positive 1.5 and the negative 1.5 or positive positive 3 if you put 2 in series and negative 3 if you put 2 in series etc now that that seems like an easy way to do it but the problem with that is that the um is that the current drain is actually going to be uh, the current drain can be different for your different cells so that means um you know a good design i wanted to have a low battery voltage detecting this so how do you detect when your battery's low? You've got two separate batteries drawing, uh, drawing different currents. So really, you know, there's, there's practical considerations there which pretty much ruled that one out if you wanted an easy to design low voltage battery detection circuit. So you think about the second one, and the second one is to generate, um, is to have two batteries in series the same. So you have three volts, say, or a one single coin cell lithium or whatever. And then you use a switch capacitor voltage inverter, like the classic um, uh, 7660 voltage inverter. And that actually just inverts your voltage from plus 3 to minus 3. So this point's ground here, and it's, you've got plus 3 here, and it generates minus 3. Now, the problem with that is that um, these can generate noise. They generate switching noise. So you've actually got to filter that and take that into consideration as well. And in a very low uh, noise design like this one we're talking about you know we're talking about microvolts so really it's a bad idea to introduce a switching element into your design and it also costs money as well it's an extra bill of materials part you need a couple of capacitors and well it's it's just not the preferred method so um number three is to get your same batteries a three volt battery and then you split it in half with two series resistors here now, these need to be very high value, so you might make them 100K or something like that, so you're not draining your battery voltage, and you tap off, they're the same value, so you tap off, you're effectively tapping off 1.5 volts, and then you need to buffer that with a, with a, um, a voltage follower op amp so that it's low impedance, and that becomes your ground. Now, you're not actually shorting the output of there because it's not actually referenced to anything. This becomes the ground, the output of the op amp becomes the ground of your circuit, and then... Um, by that nature, you've got plus 1.5 volts and minus 1.5 volts, and bingo. 
There's, um, you've got a single low cost um, cheap op amp, no switching noise, and you've generated your plus minus rails, and then you've only got a single battery to worry about for your low voltage battery detection circuit. So I choose number three. With this third option, you can actually buy a chip which actually just does this. It's a, it's a specific voltage um, a supply splitter chip and essentially integrates the, the, the two resistors and the op amp in there for you. But they're fairly exotic and they actually, they're not that cheap. They might be like a dollar each, whereas a, a, you know, a jelly bean um, op amp with, you know, doesn't matter what the input offset voltage is in this case, can be, you know, 10 or 20 cents so and and the resistors cost virtually nothing so we'll go with this option now because we actually have uh ranges based on uh milliamp microamp and nanoamp i in order of a thousand that means um to switch up to the next range you have to go to a thousand millivolts output voltage on the device now that's within the uh plus minus 1.5 volt range of the device so that's perfect and a typical uh, meter is going to be either um, it's going to be either 10,000 count or lower um, if it's 20,000 count it just means you get an extra digit of resolution it doesn't mean that it goes um, to 2 volts or something like that so everything uh, everything seemed to have fitted and we can easily power the device from uh, 1 point plus minus 1.5 volts not a problem now there's a choice of two parts with the Max on the Max 4238 or the Max 4239. I chose the Max 4239 because it's a higher bandwidth version, but its only limitation is that it needs a gain of 10. But we're going to use a gain of 100, so there's no problem at all. So we'll go with the higher uh, bandwidth part. Okay, this is terrific. Our circuit's really coming together. Here it is. We have our three range resistors. We have a dual ganged switch. We have our times 100 gain um, uh, precision max 439 op amp. Um, let's whack in a series resistor there just to provide some overload protection for the op amp so the internal diodes can clamp. Let's add a 100 ohm series resistor on the output so that um, it ensures stability of the op amp if it's driving a capacitive load we don't want it to do something silly or if you short it out we don't want to ruin the op amp so um, we choose 100R and 100R nice round values no reason for them they're just nice and round they do the job and you want to try and keep values similar in a design to lower your bill of materials parts count as well even though they're the same cost you don't want to use 100 ohms here and, and 220 ohms here because well you know that's just silly but you've got to be careful with this output resistor because you remember we're driving a multimeter and it's got an input impedance so you don't want to get extra induced error there but most digital multimeters are going to be 10 mega ohms now if you put 10 mega ohms if you do the math 100 ohm in series with 10 mega ohms the error is negligible in fact you have to get down to about 100k input impedance of the meter before the 100 ohms starts being a problem at about 0.1 uh, percent error so really it's you know it's a hundred ohm is a good value to protect it and not provide excess error when you're driving a meter one of the big things to take into account is the type of battery the battery voltage and also your compatibility with the main device you're using now the max 4239 can work anywhere single supply from 2.7 volts to 5.5 volts so um, we don't want uh, though we're powering it from a split supply the op amp doesn't really realize that it just thinks it's a single supply so if you're powering it from a 3 volt battery plus minus 1.5 volts that's fine that's within the range but the battery voltage is going to drop so in this case you don't want it to go um, essentially below that 2.7 uh, volt minimum uh, operational range for the chip. So if we decide to power a thing from 3 volts, then we need a low voltage battery detection circuit which cuts out at about 2.7 volts. Now there's many ways to do low voltage battery detection circuits but they're all very essentially the same thing. They have a voltage ref a, a precision voltage reference and a comparator. Once it drops below a certain level it, see, it switches on an output and you can turn on an LED saying low voltage. Now, um, I didn't want to muck around with things like that. It turns out that you can get a whole slew, if you go on DigiKey or Mouse, you can get a whole slew of these dedicated low voltage battery detection 
chips. They're a tiny little, uh, tiny little um, uh, three-pin device, and they just um, give you an output once they get a, below a predetermined level. And you can buy them in different voltages. In this case, I bought the TPS um, 3809L30, which is actually a 2.65 volt um, reference device. So when the input voltage from the battery drops below 2.65 volts, which is close enough to our operational range of 2.7. It, um, well, in this case, it's got a negative output, so it switches the LED off. So I'm going to have a feature on the microcurrent which has, um, which the LED is on when it's above 2.65 volts, and the LED turns off when it's below. So if the LED's off, that determines that it's, you know, you've got low battery. Whew, there you have it. That's essentially our circuit, and this is what essentially the final design of my microcurrent, what was published in Silicon Chip, and the product I actually sold. So, um, but that's not the end of the story, no, because a design, a product design, is much more than just the circuit. Sure, you can build this up on a bit of a Vera board or on a breadboard, and you know, it's 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 going to work. It's going to do the job well, apart from the low noise stuff. But let's not go into that. Um, you can build it up and it's going to work, but that doesn't make a good product. Um, there's lots of uh, choices which will also um, back interact with this circuit. So you might have to change the circuit uh, later based on the physical construction and the price constraints and other constraints in your, to actually get your practical product. So let's take a look at that. Now, although I designed the circuit first in this video, that's not necessarily the order that I'm going to do it when I design a, a practical project like this, because um, functionality and the form factor can make or break your product as well, as can the price. Price point is very important. So I wanted this design to be small and low cost. Like, um, I could put it in a standard large size Jiffy box like this. I mean, in, in Australia, we've got these Jiffy boxes, and they're sold by JCAR and, and Dick Smith and Altronics and, and others, and they're pretty much a standard box, and you drill holes for your switches, and you drill holes for your terminals, and you, there's things to mount your board inside there, there's little standoffs to mount your board, and you screw them, screw in your board, and then you wire things to the switches, and well, that's, that's pretty amateurish, um, and it can actually add to the cost and the complexity. So I wanted something smaller and low cost, so I put a, a fair bit of effort into actually minimizing the parts cost at the circuit design stage as well as the um, assembly stage too. So I pretty much decided that I didn't really want to put in one of these large size Jiffy boxes, although there's plenty of room to make it fit. So I decided the, to get the smallest Jiffy box, which also happens to be the lowest cost, it's the UB5 Jiffy box, and that's what I actually turned into the product. Because these Jiffy boxes you can get for like, you know, a dollar twenty or something like that in, in reasonably small uh, volume. So they're very cheap and simple to design around. The next decision you're going to make is how you're going to do your front panel. Now it, it comes with a it comes with a lid like this which you can have uh, professionally silk screened but that's an extra step and it costs money and then you've got to have it punched or drilled um, for your switches and your terminals and your LED and stuff like that and it's just it's really annoying and it just adds to the cost and complexity of, um, of doing a small project run for something like this. In this case you might want to make 50 or 100 of them Going to the effort to silk screen and punch a panel can be a pain in the ass, so I wanted to avoid that. So what I did is I reverted to one of my standard techniques um, to make use of the PCB. I've got to design a PCB anyway, right? So why not make it duplicate it as the front panel and mount all your components on the board? So that's exactly what I did. Here is the microcurrent. And it's, everything's mounted and self-contained on that one board. There's no wiring at all. And I made it fit the standoffs in here, and it just so happens the standoffs sit below the surface by 1.6 millimeters. You stick the board in there, and it becomes the front panel. And it, and it looks very professional. Now, a side effect of using uh, your PCB as your front panel and your entire, uh, for your entire design is that, well, Unless you want to see the circuitry on the top, which you don't, you've got to put it all underneath. And you don't want to see the solder joints on the top, so that means you're forced to use 
surface mount components. So it was pretty uh, obvious early on in my design decision that everything, every chip I chose, every part had to be a surface mount part to meet this design criteria. All right, so I've made the decision to put in a small UB5 Jiffy box. There's just enough room for your two output terminals, in which case these output terminals have to be these banana, um, uh, four millimeter banana posts. They have to be the standard uh, 19 millimeter industry standard spacing. And you've got to use these binding posts that double as banana jacks so you can use um, standard uh, multimeter banana plug probes or you can actually screw wires into them as well. Now, these are reasonably expensive, so but you know, pretty much I didn't have a choice. Um, I had to use those, or I wanted to use those, for the input. But for the output, I don't need that, because it's just going to the multimeter. So although it's always a good idea to, uh, to use common parts in your design to lower your bill of materials, not at the expense of overall project costs. In this case, in this case the input banana um, binding post terminals, they're expensive. So I didn't want to use them on the output because really the output's just permanently connected to a multimeter. You don't want to wire it up. You want to just use banana plugs that plug in like that, which then goes into your multimeter. Simple. So I used the low cost, super cheap ones. They're about a quarter of the price. Um, these little tiny four millimeter um, mounting posts. So that lowered my project cost considerably. Next up was wiring. I didn't want to wire the damn things because that's an extra assembly step and that adds cost and complexity. So what I did is I just put large pads on the on the back on the designed them into the board and then I just used the existing screws to mount them on there. Same for the same for the banana terminals as well. Now in, in case of the banana slash binding terminals, they they can come loose. So you've got to put two screws on there to hold it in place and and a bit of Loctite sometimes, but that works and I can. there's no wiring at all in this entire design. It's nice. Next up was your battery consideration. Do I use double A's, triple A's? We've determined that I, three volts is a good voltage to actually choose for that, but well, what do you use? Double A's, triple A's or lithium coin cell? Well, in this case, I didn't want extra wiring and have the batteries rattling around in the box and things like that. So I decided to go for a lithium coin cell battery which goes straight on the board like that. I've got a surface mount one and you plug in a standard CR 2032 battery. So um, I made that choice pretty early on. So when I chose the parts for my design, the Max um, 4239, the, uh, the current um, drawer of that chip was important. Same with the op amp for the uh, voltage splitter and the low voltage battery detection circuit. Uh, one of my requirements for choosing those devices was low power consumption so that it chose the lowest power consumption possible when it was switched on. And the other thing is when you've got a board as your front panel, how do you mount an LED on there? Well, you can solder it on the top, but then that's an extra assembly process because you've got to put it on the top instead of the bottom with all the other parts. So what I did is you got you can get these reverse LEDs which actually surface mount ones that actually instead of emitting, here, here's the actual LED here. So instead of actually emitting from the top like and coming out like that, which would actually come out the bottom of my board, I just drilled a hole in the board as, as part of the PCB file, put a hole in there and emits from the bottom of the device and comes out the front panel and it works really well. So the design's really starting to fall into place. I've got ways to mount my connectors, do a cheap front panel which is integrated into the board. It looks good. Get a red solder mask because red looks sexy. I've got a way to mount my LED. Now I've got a way to mount my battery with no wiring. It's all looking quite good. What's the last thing left? Well, the switches. Now because I'm using the PCB as the front panel, I can't use one of those traditional toggle switches because they would have stuck up about that far from the board and they'd look really ugly if I got like a through hole version. Um, and I couldn't really mount it through the board because then it would have wiring on the bottom and that I didn't want to do wiring. It defeated the whole nice purpose of, you know, having everything surface mount really. So I once again I did a parametric search for uh, double pole three throw switches, uh, PCB mount, um, and a slide switch is what I was looking for. So I found a, um, I found this CNK, as it turns out, there weren't too many actually that were actually available. So I found this C nice uh, CNK side, uh, slide switch, it was available in 
a uh, vertical one and a right angle. And the right angle is good because I can put the silk screen on the board like that and just have the lever right next to it, which points to the silk screen. Really quite nice. And it's only about 20 cents or something. Beauty. So I decided to base my design around those. Now, because I needed an on-off switch as well, I had to buy this special CNK switch. Well, it makes use to once again use common parts. So I decided to use the same switch for the on-off switch. Now, because it's three pole double throw, I thought, aha, uh -huh, I don't just want to go on off. Maybe I can have different modes. So it has different modes, you switch it off and then you switch it on with battery detect and the lead comes on. Now the lead actually draws excess current and if you're using this for a long time you don't want to drain your battery. So you can add a third mode where it stays on but it switches the LED off and that's exactly what I did. There was one limitation with the switch and that it could only handle a limited current up to several hundred milliamps and it had a fairly high on resistance which would contribute to the burden voltage but it wasn't too much of a big deal so um, especially considering the price and the suitability and it looks nice then I you know I, there weren't too many other choices and this was a clear winner and it was quite fortuitous that I only wanted to go to a couple hundred milliamps max anyway so really it was a great choice now I find that often when I'm designing a product or designing a circuit or whatever the, there are often these fortuitous circumstances that conspire to sort of move your project in a certain direction based on these certain lovely parts you can get. You find they're an exact fit and it's lovely. Things like getting the switch I wanted for cheaply and it just met the current range I wanted. Things like um, uh, my Maxim chip I wanted to use happened to just cut out at the um, uh, 2.7 volts right at the cutout voltage of a lithium coin cell battery. Things like that. Really nice uh, fortuitous uh, design aspects which really help make a good product. And a good designer will look for those things and take advantage of them. And as you can see, that's what I've got down here in the circuit. By fortuitous use of the same range switch up here, um, using it for the battery detect, I was able to switch between either by part turning off or on the low voltage battery detect chip to and the LED to save power. And that was a really neat little nice touch to make it a bit more professional product. Now to choose my op amp for the uh, voltage divider zero volt reference, once again I use the parametric search. I go in a generic op, op amp. I didn't uh, care um, about the offset voltage or anything like that or the bandwidth because it's just a voltage follower and um, it doesn't matter if I was millivolts, you know, 10, 20, 50 millivolts off on the center voltage. It, it's not really going to care that much. So um, really my main requirement for this was low power um, to, uh, to minimize the draw from the battery. So in this case I did a, a parametric search by price and uh, power consumption and pretty much the LMV321 popped out and that's just a low power uh, version, low power, low voltage version of the classic um, LM351. Now the other thing you've got to consider as well is the accuracy of the device. Now a typical cheapo multimeter might be 0.5% um, basic DC volts accuracy and a good meter might be 0.1% uh, or 0.05% so um, but the current ranges this is the other thing why I wanted to do this project the current ranges on most um, mid to low multimeters aren't very accurate at all they might be 1% 1.5 2% um, so they're pretty horrible so I wanted this thing to be pretty good you know I didn't want it to be 1% or half a percent so I decided to use point I decided on a, a basic spec of roughly 0.1% because you can buy 0.1% uh, resistors very cheaply so the two um, current the micro amp micro amp and the nano amp ranges you just simply buy 0.1% resistors and that sets a tolerance there the gain of the op amp these two resistors are important so you use 0.1% resistors there but the milliamp current shunt the 10 milliohm current shunt um, it's it's not impossible but it's very difficult and expensive to get a 0.1 percent 10 milliohm shunt resistor so once again I did parametric search in Mouser and DigiKey to see what I can get off the shelf and it turns out it popped out was a 0.5 percent 
10 milliohm current shunt resistor in the four terminal arrangement which we needed. So I used that and um, that's the only limitation. So the milliamp range is roughly 0.5% ignoring that and the others are roughly 0.1 plus 0.1, you know, 0.2% uh, maximum over the temperature range. So they're pretty good specs and that means that the microcurrent design is also going to improve the accuracy of your measurements, not just due to the burden voltage, but because it uses your DC millivolt range instead of your current range. So I've decided all this sort of stuff, the circuit, how it's going to be constructed, everything, before I even prototyped the circuit to see if it worked, because I pretty much knew the circuit was going to work. It's so simplistic. The chip, chips are going to meet their specs, and, and you put in some bypass caps, and they're not going to oscillate, and it, it should work just fine. So I jumped straight into doing the actual design of the board and I pretty much got it first go. I actually had to do another spin of the board because the old one, um, actually I didn't get the fonts right and they were too small and stuff like that. But um, yeah, pretty much it went first go and bingo, out the end popped the full on product. And it was low cost, it was only about $17 in parts all up for everything in this. So it's it, it easily met the uh, price, I didn't really know what my price target was, but I know I didn't want to spend 50 bucks in parts, because then when you try and sell it, well, you've got to sell it for 100 plus dollars, and, you know, that's just crazy. No one's going to pay that. But, um, yeah, even even in very small quantities, the price was only, you know, 15 17 sort of under that $20 mark, which was beautiful, which means it can be sold for 40 or $50. Once you build up your prototype, the only thing left is to measure the performance of it. Now, I just so happen to have a uh, Keithley picoamp current source, so I can generate uh, precision uh, currents down to the picoamp range, so I could easily measure the nanoamp uh, range of this device. Now, I added the nanoamp range on here because I thought it'd be real handy, but I knew it would be extremely sensitive. So, um, a standard test for um, just testing input um, uh, sensitivity to external fields is to get your mobile phone and put it near it and dial a number actually you know um, actually make it transmit and put it near the input terminals in this case it still worked pretty well because um, it's a nice tight uh, layout and it just seemed to tolerate um, external uh, electromagnetic fields pretty well so it worked um, it worked a treat really and I also at the time had access to a um, audio precision, uh, very expensive audio precision, audio analyzer. So I was able to measure the uh, the bandwidth of this thing, and the noise and the total harmonic distortion and the noise and noise floor and the bandwidth over the entire um, range. And if you take a look at my article for it, you can actually see those plots. So out the other end of all that design process, there's probably more things which go into it, and I've probably missed a couple of, uh, quite a few little subtle um, things which I put in there as well, extra effort went into certain aspects and decisions and stuff like that, but I couldn't do them all. But what popped out the other end was a really cool little product which um, is reasonably, uh, reasonably uh, low cost and there's nothing else on the market like it. So very often in a lot of my product uh, designs, I will, the, the, the circuit's, almost, you know, the circuit is almost totally irrelevant. Um, it's all about form factor, um, meeting a price point, uh, usability, things like that. They're what's going to, appearance of the design, they are what's going to, they could make or break your product. So really, um, you know, you can't just slap something in a, in a jiffy box and whack some switches on it and stuff like that and expect it to be a winning product. That's not necessarily the case. So um, I hope that next time you design something, you'll actually put a lot of thought into a lot of little subtle aspects of it, and it's uh, electronics design is more than just circuit design. Now the other major thing you've got to think about during the whole design, not just up front, and I should have probably mentioned this right at the start as well, is that you've got to think about what the target, uh, what your target market or your target audience is. Now in this case, it wasn't just for me, otherwise I would have just, you know, slapped it in a box and, and put some letter set lettering on it or something like that, real simple stuff. Um, but no, I wanted, because um, I knew friends and colleagues would want one as well, and I also thought, hey, it'd be a great project 
to share with uh, share with the community as well. So I thought um, it'd make a real interesting uh, construction article in a magazine like Silicon Chip. So I knew that I would have to. My target market was uh, the, the you know a small run of kits or something like that. I knew people would want kits or ready-made ones. You know, we're only talking about, you know, a couple of hundred. We're not talking 10,000 or something like that. So really, those sort of choices, um, uh, that that market will determine a lot of your component choices, which go into your design, component and other aspects of the design as well. Whether you're going to assemble it yourself, whether you're going to test it yourself, whether you're going to get somebody else to do it, or whatever. There's lots of uh, factors there which can go into it as well. You have to take into account from the start of the project. Now, if you do a breakdown on how much time and effort actually goes into designing the actual circuit as opposed to the actual product, you'll find you probably spend most time um, searching for suitable parts to find to meet some uh, design criteria, either a circuit design criteria and or a uh, visual usability functionality um, uh, design criteria as well. So. Now, a lot of electronics design is not just grabbing, you know, parts from your junk bin and slapping something together. It's 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 really making a lot, you know, sometimes hundreds of little individual choices, and each one of those can involve hours, sometimes hours, of searching for each one of those decisions to come up with the best choice to go into your final product. Whew. So there you go. That's how I designed a product from concept through to final design. And as you can see, there's more than just designing circuits. There's all sorts of things, even a simple design like this, which is basically a shunt resistor and an op amp in a box with an LED and a switch and a couple of switches. There's there's more subtleties that go into designing a, a decent quality product like this. So I hope that's been useful for you and you can make use of those techniques in your next design. See ya.